The following discussion is not necessarily the views of all involved. The goal is to start open and honest discussion in the Christian worldview. Like all things, weigh what you hear with what you know and join us in our pursuit for the truth. Enjoy the podcast. Moses rips his Beyblade and parts the Red For real? Sea. Yeah. Universe. I know it's Mormonism. It's just DLC. Yeah, it's a mod version. <laughs> it's unlicensed. It's unlicensed. <laughs> Did you know the city of Enoch is in the Gulf of Mexico? <laughs> How'd he get there and then back in time for the flood? <laughs> All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Second Rate Saints podcast. I'm one of your hosts here, Caleb. To my left is... Josh. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. To my left. I'm Joel. And I, apparently we're updating how we feel when we do our intros, which is cool. I'm feeling well. And to my left... It's me again. I didn't get to mention how I feel. Um, I feel very happy that Josh is happy to be here. I'm happy to be here. I haven't been here for a couple of weeks. Hmm. I've been I've been missing me. <laughs> when I listen to the podcast and I'm not there, you know. <laughs> oh man, you'll be really good at this podcast. My voice. <laughs> <laughs> I do that to every podcast I listen to. Though. Um, Joel, what do we do on the internet? Um, just <laughs> the expectation is that I'm going to ruin this intro, but I I might not. Um, we're just hanging out on secondratesaints.com. If you want to check out what we're doing with book reviews, uh, with our podcast episodes and with, um, our blog posts, um, check us out. Yeah. And, uh, that should have links to pretty much everything we're going to be doing now and in the future. So, uh, we've got some ideas for different projects down the road. And if you'd like to keep up with that, that's the best way to do it. We're also on Instagram, Twitter, and threads, which is kind of a new platform to me. I haven't done much on Twitter or threads. Um, yeah, that's probably the best way to get a hold of us. That's awesome. Oh, uh, also, uh, secondratesaints at gmail.com if you want any long-form questions to be answered. Um, we love feedback, and uh, actually today is a Thoughts in Real Time episode, if you haven't noticed from the title. So uh, if you send in questions, they could be featured. They probably will be featured in an episode just like this one today. So thanks for your interaction, and thanks for your support thus far. Caleb. You um, have this nasty habit of reading. It's every now and then I have to take it's something. Hard for to it. let go of. Yeah. 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 Um, what What has captured your attention? Uh, fortunately, recently, um, I put some of the other books that I was reading on hold for a split second to read this very very small book. It's really two essays um, called "Eucharistic Participation" by Hans Borisma. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of it's hard to call it a systematic theology. If anything, it's more like a historical it's more like a biblical historical bl- bl- like blurring those two mm-hmm. um practices um historical biblical theology um yeah and essentially he goes over what would essentially be um a more quasi anglican view of the eucharist mm. um coming from a reformed background um mm-hmm. the main the main feature with this is his his kind of defense of the classical way that things and more defense of how the fathers also articulated um the eucharist Um, but also how he points out how it's like yeah the church fathers didn't go as far full-blown as uh as let's say transubstantiation or luther's consubstantiation um and then he also articulates hey how do we articulate it as how do we use sacrificial language in it Mm -hmm. without you know someone going ah but then you're saying that's a different sacrifice than jesus wants for all sacrifice and then how is jesus physically present how should we articulate that can we articulate that Mm. um what is the function of us saying jesus is physically present and so um yeah it's it's like 72 pages it's super short Mm -hmm. um is it fairly recent um, last two years. Okay. Yeah. Cause that's out of, out of region, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Guy used to go to my church. Yeah. Really? No. Yeah. Another reformed guy. That's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, he was a reformed turned Anglican in the last mm-hmm. four or five years. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, no, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to read. Mm-hmm. Um, like the words are easy, but then the concepts are, are a bit abstract. Mm. 
Yeah, he's a he's a very deep thinker. Yeah. 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 Um if you like early church stuff and you like are trying to wrestle with some like questions that span multiple denominations and denominational dialogue and whatnot, mm-hmm. it's an awesome read for 72 pages, which you could pick up and just read it in an afternoon, like, like no, in an, in a couple hours. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I don't even know if I fully agree with him personally. Mm. It's just. Is it an agree or disagree kind of book or does he lay out multiple perspectives? It's an agree or disagree, mm. but like not in like a, if you like, here's my argument sort of way. Yeah. It's more just like, Hey, this is a reflection on essentially like a more Anglican leaning hmm. view mm-hmm. of the Eucharist. And it's kind of more like a defense than like an assertion. This is the way it is. Yeah. It's more like, Hey, this is why we think this, but like, mm-hmm. and this is like some cool thoughts about it and why this, and this is how it's connected. And this is our defense against this approach. Yeah. And it's it's hard to say exactly what it is. His main like the the subtitle of it is The Reconfiguration of Time and Space. Which is like what does that have to do with That's the Eucharist? Awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um and so his argument is that Jesus um through the incarnation and whatnot, he, he leans more Lutheran in this in this sense than let's say reformed. Um Jesus is physically present in it and we participate f- like physically in a, in a covenantal sense mm-hmm. with Christ's sacrifice. Yeah. That's what's in, in a, in a, mis, in a mysterious way to the Eucharist that's offered on Sunday. Yeah. That is, it, it, it's, there's, there's a link there and not just like a symbolic link, but there's an actual link. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I know in our, our communion episode, if you go back and, and listen to that, we, I think we laid out four or maybe five different views, mm-hmm. um, kind of spanning the whole thing, transubstantiation, uh, consubstantiation, uh, covenantal, and symbolic. Mm-hmm. And there was one other that fits in there somewhere. But where would you say this guy lands? Because yeah. I know Reformed said it was closer to covenantal. But if you say he's present in the Eucharist, then it's closer to consubstantiation, which is what you were referencing there with it being more Lutheran. Um, it's technically transcelimentation. Trans, I'll, this word here. <laughs> okay. Transimultation. Okay, that's, that's cool. That's technically what it's called. I, I don't know if I've ever heard that term. Here. Can I see it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, part of it is he argues a bit of like, yeah, this is this is more or less what the church fathers went as far as. Mm. He, Trans-elementation. Trans-elementation. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. Forgive me. I'm He's a literary. reading expert. Well, no, no, no. Because, it, because the, often the bread and wine are referred to as the elements. Yes. And so mm. the elements are transferred. Uh, um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's... It's good. I like it. It was a nice little read. Josh, cover. One to five. Uh, I'm going to give it a four. Four? Really? Okay. Well, it's minimalist, and it gives, like, it's it's like a, what it would be the term? It's like a twist on uh, early church art. Cool. I like that. Yeah. It's, I look at it, and I don't think I have the artistic skills to understand exactly what's going on. Um, like like you said, early church uh, mm-hmm. art. It's but it's like like a even that his twist hands are it. bigger, and it's like kind of emphasizing that. Yeah, he's got that whole perspective it. weirdness yeah. that goes on in, what, in a lot of icons. What's the positions mm-hmm. of his hands, like his fingers? Like they're open. What just open. Yeah, yeah. Just open. open and slightly pointed certain downwards. Eastern Orthodox art will have different finger positions mean yeah. different things. Yeah, yeah. Have you guys seen so. the explanation of why the Orthodox cross is slightly skewed at the bottom? I've read a couple. I've seen. There was thought. one I saw from an, an Orthodox. Uh, what would their position be? Bishop or priest or something something along those lines? I mean, there's patriarchs. The rest would be bishops and priests. Yeah, he, he was something. He was he was higher up in that. And uh, he was talking about how the slope is pointing to uh, one of the thieves going up and one of the thieves going down. That's <laughs> and awesome. It's like that is, that is really cool. I, I do like how much symbolism they have in mm-hmm. their in their crucifixes. And that's that's what I think of when I when I look at that. For some reason, it's like Eastern Orthodox um, stuff. But. Yeah, I'd love to do redo. Um, I shouldn't say redo. I'd love to do communion again because I think both (laughs) um, Joel and myself, our positions have shifted, not in the same directions, but just shifted. And it would be cool not to just do one where we cover the theories, but to just dialogue about it with where we're at. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That'd be be interesting. Um, But that's not the topic of this episode. You don't know that. (laughs) Interesting. (laughs) 
<laughs> You're right. I don't know because thoughts in real time. Thoughts I have no idea. Yeah. So uh, the format of this episode, as I mentioned before, is I'm bringing questions, comments, and concerns to my fellow second-rate saints um, and getting kind of a, they might be one or two sentences or we might take up the whole podcast just talking about one thing. We probably won't. I'll try and make sure that doesn't happen. We'll but, rein ourselves uh, in. Someone will have to. Um, but yeah, and I'm just going to read off some questions, either questions I found online in different apologetics communities um, or sent in from our listeners. Uh, we have quite a few of those. Yeah. yeah. Let me just pull these up. I'm excited. Kind of. I'm also horrified because... You know, because okay. you're coming. you're a bit elitist when it comes to questions. What what is that no. supposed to mean? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so I saw this I saw this quote, and uh, we are I would say a multi denominational podcast in a lot of mm-hmm. ways because we have uh, oftentimes we even talked about it today um, different views on like communion and stuff. We'd like to cover all of it. Um, I saw this really jarring quote online, and I'm going to see mm-hmm. what you guys think it means for denominations within the church. I like jarring. Um, Unity and peace are not ultimate goals in a sinful world. Better division than collective apostasy. I agree. Okay, yeah, no, but it's not like a yes or no thing. Oh, Um, ecumenicalism, technically, you have like the generic term, but you also Mm -hmm. have the heresy term. It's like giving up distinctives in the sake of unity. Do you want to explain what ecumenicalism is? So, like, ecumenical is just multi-church, multi-denominational. Like, that's why they'll they'll mention the church, early church councils. Those are ecumenical councils. They had rep- bishops from all around the church, although more Eastern than Western, but many Western bishops and, like, the uh, specifically the Bishop of Rome would send um, representatives. And so they're, like, they were, they were representative of the entire church coming together to discuss mm-hmm. a topic, and that's why they're mm-hmm. ecumenical. The, idea, the heresy of ecumenicalism mm-hmm. is giving up your distinctives and the things that you hold as like v- very true of the faith mm-hmm. for the sake of, well, uh, well let's just agree. It, it's okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, like, you know, like for the East and the West, like uh, for, for Rome and the Eastern Orthodox to come together right now without them actually disagreeing, like without them mm-hmm. actually, comp- they'd have to compromise. And that would co- that would cost ecumenical. That would be ecumenicalism. Is ecumenicalism just a lower commitment of universalism? No, because they, they'll still often because because it's a it's a behavioral thing, not a belief system, mm. right? Yeah. Okay. And there, there should be there should be unity within the whole church, mm-hmm. in that we treat each other as brothers of Christ. We love each other, regardless of how different. Pentecostals and Eastern Orthodox can be very different organizations, yeah. but based on the fact that we both agree in the basics of Christianity, okay. we should be able to work together. Kind of, except what happens if half of their theology mm-hmm. is like how, how many passages, uh, there's, 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 there's many passages about Jesus saying like, you know, you have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, which Eucharist we were just talking about. But there's several passages that are like, unless you do, you will not taste eternal life. Mm-hmm. And it has always been the Eastern Orthodox view. Mm, I might actually be stepping out of line and know more about this with Catholics. We'll go with Catholics, sure. And not always. A good chunk of Catholic history and even modern Catholics go, no, that your communion, your elements, mm-hmm. um, that's not, it's not uh, blessed and certified by a by a priest who, who has his blessing from the bishop, who has his blessing lineage all the way back mm-hmm. to the apostles with apostolic lineage. Therefore, that's not actually a proper communion. Therefore, you're not actually having Jesus' body and blood. Therefore, you will not taste eternal life. Mm. It's like, okay. But at the end of the day, you both believe in Jesus. So, like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. is ecumenicalism just a failure to see where the hard lines are? I think it's it's the disagreement between the. I'm trying first, to simplify it because it's a very complicated sh- idea. Sure, uh, yeah. if I'm if I'm gonna try to help, let, let's go to the the theological triage, right? Mm-hmm. You have your first your your mm-hmm. let's say number one, right? It's like your top tier on a triangle, right? Mm-hmm. You have your number one things. These are what make you definitionally a Christian. Yeah, you know, um, the Nicene Creed, 
Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, Trinitarianism. Yeah. Um, uh, the deity the of Christ. The incarnate. Yeah. The deity of Christ, the incarnation. Um, Christ, death and resurrection. Right? Those are definitionally mm-hmm. things. If you disagree with those, you are not a Christian. Mm-hmm. You believe things about Jesus, but you're not a Christian. Um, t- secondary things are things like denominational differences, right? So mm-hmm. like if the Eastern Orthodox want to articulate um, sin more as a sickness than like the, the Western um, original sin concept, yeah. um, th- if their theology are built on those, they'll articulate salvation very differently from one another. Mm-hmm. So much so that they can't be in the same building and worship God in peace, hmm. right? Yes, but they can still recognize each other as brothers in Christ. Yes, exactly, exactly. And so... But it, bear with me. The yeah. third one is disagreements that you can have in-house, right? Like, yeah. It's, it's disagreements that you'll have with the gen, with like what, how worship should be run, but you'll still go to the same church with the person, mm-hmm. you'll still worship together, and you can still... Yeah. Absolutely. And so those are the three categories, and I think the, the ecum, ecumenicalism occurs when things that are in category one... Mm-hmm. Um, are mixed up with things in category two or vice versa. Mm-hmm. Um, so in, in my mind, there's a, in a real world um, kind of context, this is happening right now with Seventh-day Adventists. Mm-hmm. They are looking to be recognized by evangelical Christianity kind of as a whole as being a legitimate denomination. Um, the reason they haven't been at a legitimate do- denomination for a long time is because they've been putting in tier one the writings of Ellen G. White <laughs> and these different things um, that they hold as um, being mm-hmm. part of the Christian faith that technically are are not. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's just a whole mess of issues. Um, or like uh, Sabbath being a, a level one issue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's that's a better example. People would understand that one more than Ellen G. White. Don't look into it. It's whatever, you know. Um in what ways should we be able to compromise as denominations for the betterment of God's kingdom? And in what way should we, we, we be willing to cut off denominations that are notably false and make salvific issues out of things that are not salvific issues? Well, like, let's go back to the, even though none of us um, are from a, uh, let's say, an apostolic lineage church, mm. does apost- is apostolic lineage necessary? Because throughout Christian history, it had been. Mm. And many apostolic lineage churches still claim it to be. Necessary for salvation? Well, necessary for the legitimacy of church. Mm. And it's a legitimacy. Of, and it's the church that offers um, communion and baptism. And so if it's not a legitimate church, are you getting legitimately... Are, is your baptism and, and communion legitimate? Don't freak out about this whole stuff, people. Mm-hmm. There's people within apostolic lineage churches, their own theologians, they're like, yeah, God looks at the heart. What are we arguing about? Yeah. Yeah. God works through broken systems like our own. The requirement of baptism provided was the the faith of the individual in Christ. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, and one of the things with even the early church was like, what happens if they don't get baptized quite properly? Right. Mm-hmm. Um I'm like, okay, so it should have been in rushing water, but it's not. But what happens if it's poured water, but it's not? Mm-hmm. What happens if the wording gets a little messed up? What's up? Mm-hmm. And so one of the things was, it's the intent. Mm-hmm. And I, I heard a podcast recently where it's like, if you were to do a play and you're redoing, let's say, um, uh, the baptism of Jesus or something, right? And Or not just the baptism of Jesus, like the baptism of, of, of a Christian in some, some play, mm-hmm. right? Um, if you were to do the whole, in the name of the Father, dunk, in the name of the Son, dunk, in the name of the Holy Spirit, dunk, um, that's not a real baptism. It's a play. Yeah. It's the intent. So you not only does the form, mm. and not only does the form have to be there, um, and like the, the, uh, the words, but the intent has to be there too. Mm. Yeah. You can't accidentally get baptized to God. Yeah. And so, so the argument yeah. would be, um, the, the f- some of the the let's say the the legitimacy or the like this quote unquote I shouldn't say legitimacy the form may be lacking at least according to some of these apostolic lineage churches um, the form may be lacking but the intent is there and the yeah. materials there like and, and mm-hmm. like the words are there it's and you can still fail in intent but like yeah yeah but yeah and, that, and that's 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 the idea of like it's you know hmm. 
I'm sorry, I went way off on a sidetrack with that. No, this is good. Um, the only thing I was going to say with the like division thing is when they say division, do they mean within the world or within the church? And so in the world, the only division there should be theoretically is between the sheeps and the goats. Um, mm-hmm. But within the church, there is accepted division amongst, for example, denominations, because it's it's not things like Paul is talking about in First Corinthians, where it's like, I follow this guy or I follow this guy. Mm-hmm. Those divisions are unacceptable because they need to compromise on those. They need to get together, deal with their issues and figure out what's going on. Can I ask you a question then? One second. Okay. But if it's things that don't matter, right? Like mm-hmm. we talked about with the theological triage, then the, the denominational differences like apostolic lineage, all that stuff that prevents somebody from being able to even worship, mm. but prevents the church from functioning. And so for the church to function, like with any family, people need to spend time apart. So there's yeah, different you'll, groups. You'll come oh, together at family reunions, yeah. but you can't live in the same house. Yeah. Hmm. That's sad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, question then. I know, I know this is, this is a little disingenuous, but it's funny. Um, so you're saying like churches, like the Lutherans who follow Luther and the Menno, like the Mennonites who follow Menno mm-hmm. Simon. Um, how is that different than I follow Paul and I follow Apollos? Because the, first of all, the, yeah, it's, it's so difficult. Church history's rough, man. Church history's rough. The the I I would I could say definitely that there are denominations that should not be split. My favorite thing is there's in the town of Linden in the US, there are three reformed churches, CRC churches on the same street corner. They, they all look awesome though. Yeah. Like- Third, fourth, and seventh reformed church in the city of Linden. There's seven reformed churches in the city of Linden. Yeah. Linden has like maybe ten thousand people. That sucks. Right. And it's just like all three of those congregations, mm-hmm. you're in the same denomination. Yeah. Get together in one building, turn one into a food kitchen, and turn the other one to a youth center. Yeah. <laughs> like. Yeah, it is. It is disappointing when you see disunity like that mm-hmm. within one denomination. I don't know. I, I str- I've always struggled with denominations right from the beginning of college. Yeah. Um, like yeah, it's, it's a big thing. But actually, that leads into I'm going to do a denomination question, which is not going to take as much time as what we've just done. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to hop into something else that I think Josh is really going to enjoy. Um, <laughs> okay. So it was a, uh, article posted by the Babylon Bee. Mm-hmm. Love okay. it. And it was a guide to different denominations. Mm. Um, there was not a reformed one. There was Presbyterian, but no reformed. Well, Presbyterian uh, is a branch, like the, within, I, I know they're close, but that was the closest they had. Well, within ref, uh, reformed theology. They are just one of the many branches. They, they just, called Anglicanism uh, Kirkland Catholicism. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, can you explain the difference between high Anglican and low Anglican? Uh, <laughs> and um, why that would actually make sense for it to be Kirkland brand Catholicism? Um, so oof, I'm going to... So I've been studying... I've been trying to study Anglicanism. Um, I'm going to try. Low Anglicanism in the modern day low Anglicanism or a low Anglican church or just low church will look in many ways similar to an evangelical church. They'll probably still have the Eucharist as the main like centerpiece of the, uh, of the service. However, they'll have like a full, like a normal band from Mm -hmm. what you'll see in like a, in a generic evangelical church. Um, A high Anglican church or what can be called Anglo Catholic church will continue to have the liturgy system and oftentimes order of service um, in a way like a Catholic, like a Catholic church, mm. right? The whole, when you rise, you sit down and you do this, right? And we all say this prayer together and mm-hmm. it's, it's based very, it's, it's, it's right out of the book of common prayer, right? Yeah. Um, and so, so there's, there's like a procession coming in. Um, uh, there's still like you, you bow to the altar, when you when you get out of the aisle and whatnot, not everyone does even in a high Anglican church. And so there's 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 you blur in with some with some Catholic stuff. Mm. Um, I don't know, I don't know how different a high Anglo Catholic 
service would be from a Catholic service. It's been a long time since I've been to a mass. Hmm. Um, like oof, six, seven years. Oh my goodness. Oh, I thought, yeah, you're, you're attending a uh, part-time in Anglican church now, but that's, that's low Anglican, is it? Nope. That's Anglo-Catholic. Anglo-Catholic. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and then uh, I'm going to go over the Pentecostal one because I thought it was funny. A denomination started in the early 20th century. Attending a Pentecostal worship service is like going to a drug-fueled rave for Jesus. <laughs> I thought that was kind of tasteless, but whatever. What's not to like? And best of all, if you don't like what Scripture says, just have your own personal revelation and write it in the back of your Bible. <laughs> <laughs> that is a scathing review of the Pentecostal hermeneutic. I mean, funny. <laughs> funny. But their Pentecostals, I've found, are also the first people to tell you not to add or take away from Scripture. Yeah, but then they'll immediately go. That's only right after they told you their futurist view of Revelation. Yeah. it's yeah. And God told me something today. And then they mixed one up and called it Cavalry Chapel instead of Calvary Chapel. And it said it was a cult based around horses. And I thought that was <laughs> much, much better. Love that. That's funny. Okay, Josh, here's your fun question. Okay. How does God feel personally towards the devil? <laughs> um, does God hate the devil or does he feel pity towards his fallen creature? Or does he just regard the devil as a failed experiment? Mm. How recently have you read Paradise Lost? <laughs> this is a very Paradise sorry, Lost-esque sorry, question. Sorry, Caleb. I don't regard Paradise Lost as authoritative on the discussion oh. of Satan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, He's like one of the main characters, dude. <laughs> Um, what's interesting, first of all, is how little Satan is discussed in Bible. <laughs> we make a big deal about him, and the Bible spends very little on him. Yeah. Um, for good reason, because when you're following God, you need to focus on him, not on the enemy. Mm-hmm. You don't need to turn around and look back. You need to look forward. Um, and so that's part of the reason why. Mm-hmm. Um, but how does he feel towards the devil? I think he feels towards him the same way he does all his enemies. Mm. Um, I'm sure. So some things we got to understand about Satan is if he is presented as in the biblical text as the highest of angels, right? Other mm-hmm. than the angel of the Lord. Um, he has an extreme amount of authority and responsibility. And there's a relationship that he has with God in closeness that the rest of creation doesn't, didn't. Um, And there's an ethic within scripture that the more authority and responsibility you have, the greater the judgment when you fall. Mm. Um, Moses makes one mistake. He says, we, not me, we, not you. When he smashes the rock, how long Mm. do we have to keep doing this for you? Right. And God's like, we, oh, there's no, we, it's, it's just me. I'm doing this. Yeah. Um, and he was not able to enter the promised land. Um, after doing everything he did. Mm-hmm. Right. And whereas other Israelites sinned and failed, but were not barred because he represented God at a higher level than the rest of Israel did. He had a, he had a greater responsibility. Yeah. Um, and so if you continue that ethic or like in the new Testament, when it says teachers will be judged more harshly, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Cause you have a responsibility yeah. that the learner doesn't. Um, and so with an individual like Satan mm-hmm. who is described pre fall as being so grand and important that when he falls, his judgment and, Therefore, the wrath he receives from God mm-hmm. is going to be so much greater. Yeah. Um, but um, when you see God talk to him, it's always rebuke and command. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, he curses him first in the yeah. Garden of Eden story mm-hmm. in Genesis 3. And he specifically states that I will put enmity between you and the woman. Mm. her descendants and yours. Um, And whenever you see, and so in Job, when you see Satan go to heaven to talk with God, like all the other sons of God, all the other angels, um, 
God brings up Job to him. Satan mentions to God, if you, cur- if you didn't pr- bless him the way you did, <laughs> he would curse you to his face. Yeah. And God says, okay, go do as you, go do as you say. Yeah. Right. Satan didn't bring up Job. Satan only told God, hey, this is what would happen. Yeah. Right. And God made him do it. <laughs> um. So we don't really get like an image of anything other than like, it's not like a pity. It's not like he's a tragic character in the same way. He is, he has rebelled against God and does not have the same forgiveness we have as, yeah. Um, as humans. And I think that's something that's missed is, is seeing him as, as, uh, and part of that is because of paradise lost. Mm-hmm. Um, just the way, uh, Milton describes him kind of as mm-hmm. the first anti-hero a little yep. bit. Right. And, uh, I think that's definitely affected culture in a certain way. I, I might lead mm-hmm. that into a, a, another question in a minute. But. Yeah. Well, and the last thing I want to say is the majority of times you see Satan actually present in the story, not just mentioned, but present. Mm-hmm. He's in the presence of God. Yeah. That's very, that's very confusing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We don't like that. Mm-hmm. Um, he's in the garden. He's in heaven in the story of Job in Zechariah. He's at the right hand of the angel of the Lord, which being at the right hand of anything is a seat of authority. Yeah. Um, and the, and in Jesus's, uh, uh, temptation, he, Jesus is led into the desert to be tempted by the devil, by the Holy spirit. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I think there's an uncomfortable amount. Of- yeah. I won't say cooperation because I don't think it's cooperation, but no. let's say um, intended usefulness. The Satan, like everything, no matter how great he is, to, to speak of his power, so mm-hmm. to speak, is as far away from God as we are. Yeah. Um, he, like all the other demons, is utterly forced to obey when God commands him to do something. Yeah. And our fiction of Satan has presented him as the ruler of hell. And not once has he mentioned being there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He mentions being cast to earth. Yeah. Falling to earth like lightning. Or as Satan says, when God asks Satan, where were you? He's just walking to and fro on the earth where you sent me. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and against that, you sent me there. Yeah. There's there's an uncomfortable amount of relationship, but it's very, it's very forced. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. it's God saying, go, do this. And I think the way to think about it is Satan decided to be the enemy in the garden. He decided to rebel. So you go with Satan's rebellion was Genesis 3? So I, I think it is. Okay. It's not a previous angelic rebellion. And then the the story in Ezekiel where you get that yeah, is predicated on him being in the garden. Mm-hmm. Okay. It opens up with you were in need in the garden of God. And then it talks about his downfall. Okay. And so... There's a surprising number of commentators that also link that to being... Yeah. Uh, talking about Adam's original sin rather than it being Satan himself. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it actually using like a parallel of like man has suffered the same fate as the worst of all angels kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's a, uh, it's a little more complicated than just cast out of heaven. Cause that's what everyone will say is like, Oh, a third of angels left and he was cast out of heaven. And that's all you need to know about demons. And it's like, <laughs> no, no, it's, you need to know more. He, <laughs> maybe no, not. it's not you need to know more. <laughs> that's Satan. not the part that's important. Yeah. no, <laughs> Satan is, he is the enemy. He is the devil. He is the one trying to trip us and make us fall. Mm. But he's not outside of God's control. Mm. Interesting. And I think part of Genesis 3, the curse that says, "You, I will put enmity between you and the woman, her descendants and yours, mm-hmm. is Satan wanted to be the enemy. He opposed God. Mm. And God is now as... Satan's curse, making him be the enemy. Hmm. In in the same way that in Rev, in Romans, that it says, uh, he, God gives us over to our sinful desires. Yeah. God has given Satan over to his desire to be the enemy. I like that. That's a good. 
Like that's, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Do you want to be the rebel? Okay, you're going to be the rebel in the story. Mm-hmm. Have fun. Yeah. <laughs> I always win. Yeah. I don't know. God's God's use of suffering is is uh, a huge huge issue mm-hmm. um, for a lot of people. It's it's a very common one you get. Is um, I guess you can look at our the Odyssey episode mm-hmm. we just did recently. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. I don't think we covered Satan as heavily in that one. And, and even if the the theological question does not answer the emotional question of it, mm-hmm. God's no. use of evil, right? Yeah, like you can have a the like whether whether or not how that's articulated theologically can have multiple questions and whatnot. Yeah, mm-hmm. how your answers to those questions and which way they go does not even get close to the different emotional connections that we would think to those things. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, people are so morbidly curious about demonic stuff. Yeah, well, um, it's, what is it that C.S. Lewis said that there's all like, um, it's either there's the two extremes are mm-hmm. the, are the worst things to be fascinated by them or think they don't exist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and then there's of course the phrase, uh, Satan's greatest trick was convincing everyone he didn't exist. Yeah. Satan's right? greatest achievement. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Um, but I, I found that I was, uh, I was speaking to a couple of, of youths at a, at a Bible camp, right. Um, after a service, I mean, it was actually service on the Holy spirit mm. and, uh, we just, they, they wanted to know about demonology. And I was like, wow, as a, as a Protestant denomination, we have a severely underdeveloped understanding of what mm-hmm. that means. Um, but of course I tied it back to, because of the Holy Spirit message into, uh, in a way, the power of exorcism through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. which is just insane to me. Anyways, I'm sorry. I'm derailing this into, uh, that was <laughs> good. Caleb might not even agree with me on that one, but I don't know. Yeah, it was I, better than just telling him, "Oh well, a third left." <laughs> and then it was there's you know, demons out Joel, there. I don't think you need to apologize. This episode's called "Thoughts in Real Time," so we're gonna spiral. Oh yeah, we're gonna spiral. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Okay, we talked about Christian fiction in the form of John Milton's Paradise Lost. Yes, and this uh, actually touches on an issue um, that I discovered I was very passionate about this week. <laughs> As I was uh, speaking to somebody who was reading a Left Behind esque book series, mm. um, what's you know, it called? I, I don't. She wasn't able to tell me. That sounds like she doesn't want to tell you. I mean, mm. <laughs> no, it was it was a it was a natural conversation. I think she would have told me if she had remembered the, the sounds, name of the author. That sounds though like a I'm asking for a friend, like a little bit. Where yeah. it's just like I'm, I'm not reading, a book reading like series. Left Behind. Yeah. It's not Left Behind. Yeah but it's like Left Behind. I've read a significant amount. It's actually Left Behind. (laughs) I own all 19 books. There's 19 books. (sighs) Why not just go for 20? I don't know. There might, it might be less or more. I can't remember, but I do have 19 books. That sucks. Which is crazy to me. And I've read a, a couple of them. So the issue I have is that he describes the books as prophetical fiction. Mm-hmm. And that's always been my problem with it, because what he's doing is he's not using scripture to inspire stories. He's using the authority of scripture to sell stories. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? And that's my problem with, with Christian art a, a lot of times, is um, God has not given you his uh, you know creative commons to just take from and make art as you see fit. It's a little bit like AI, how AI will make art just taking uh, little bits from you know, all over the internet and throwing them together. I don't think that's what we should be doing as Christian artists. I, I, and I see ourselves as Christians in media. We should really have something to say on that. I have, like, I agree, but I, I do have one question. Yeah. There's a series done by New Testament scholars called a week in the life, in, a week, a week in the life of something, something. Uh, ben Witherington writes two of them. He's a New Testament scholar, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, kind of the, the cutting edge of the socio-rhetorical, um, hermeneutical uh, commentaries and that type of Bible reading. And so he does a couple of fictional books, A Week in the Life of, of Corinth, of a Christian in Corinth, or mm-hmm. A Week in the Life of the Downfall of Israel, yeah. mm-hmm. or Downfall of Jerusalem, sorry, like that. Um, and it is a narrative set mm-hmm. in that context. Yeah. Is he using the Bible as a cash grab? No, I don't think so. I agree. Um, 
because the Bible is not the authority of what it was like to live in Corinth. Yes. And he's writing to educate people in a way that they will understand. Yeah. Well, that's, that's almost a mnemonic device in, in a lot of ways is, oh, I remember this story that was not a true story, but it helps me, yeah. you know, kind of remember what street Paul was on. It's like, yeah. <laughs> well, and it's, it's a straight street. Yeah. 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 Main, main street, right? <laughs> um, but no, it's, 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 those books are written to get you to, for people who wouldn't just sit down and read a backgrounds of Christianity textbook, because Anyway, um, <laughs> we would, but <laughs> um, to present the information that comes from that to people who otherwise wouldn't read that. And then when they read their Bible, they're like, oh, I get it. That's why these characters act that way. That's why these people do the things. This mm-hmm. is why this is such a, oh man, they make this argument. That's wild in that culture. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's a, to familiarize people that would otherwise, it, it's basically to put academic study in a format that the common layman would read. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why I think it's not what you're describing in the Left Behind. And and in this uh, Left Behind esque series, I was told that each chapter has a review telling you what verses inspired that chapter. Oh. And and to me, um, you're reading onto the text rather than reading away from it. Uh, I was told one of the plot points was uh, twelve. Um, men from Israel were part of the 144,000 and protected from some kind of magic. It's crazy. It, it does turn into um, Christian fan fiction. And I'm not saying they're Mormonism. adding or taking away. I'm not saying anything like that. But when you take the Bible and you use the authority of Scripture, I know it's Mormonism. It's just as it got, DLC. It, that got, uh, no, that's no. a... That's a that's uh, the New com- Testament. No, <laughs> New Testament is DLC. Mormonism's expansion pack. Yeah, not just, but it's an un, it's yeah. a mod version. <laughs> it's unlicensed. It's unlicensed. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Oh uh, yeah. Oh uh, sorry. Cut Man, you Mormon theology is so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I should say more of a theology. Mormon history is, is really hard. Did you know the city of Enoch is in the Gulf of Mexico? <laughs> How'd he get there and then back in time for the flood? <laughs> I like the idea that the auto laugh button for Josh is Mormonism. <laughs> okay, Joe, back know. to the question. I'm um, so sorry. Anyway, so my question, and we'll tie this in with Paradise Lost, but what hermeneutic edification can fiction have on um, a Christian worldview? I have re say that. What authority again. does Paradise Lost have to to talk about the character of Satan? What authority does Left Behind have to say about the fulfillment of the prophecies in Revelation? What uh, authority, like that? That's kind of what yeah, I'm getting at. You see, the Paradise Lost is a particularly specific example because it's yeah. one of the greatest pieces of English poetry. Okay, well then let's say what does Dante's Inferno have to say about hell, right? Like these things. Oh, like how much are we able to actually glean from these things before I, we realize it's just extrapolation on a very specific topic in the Bible by a specific individual for a specific time? Oh, I I mean Paradise Lost, he's not trying to actually say what Satan is. It's art, not. Yeah. I think it has to do with the intent a bit. Yeah. Right? I would agree. Cuz He's trying to. Well, he's actually trying to make enough money so that his daughters can uh, uh, can survive after his death. That's one of his yeah. main motivations in writing. A lot of people, <laughs> a lot yeah, of Milton? paradise like rain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. also, a lot of people make the mistake that he's sympathizing with the devil. Yeah. Because there's a bit of it where it's the the devil is uh, like regretful. It kind of places him as a victim. Mm -hmm. But the idea is not that you become sympathetic with the devil. The idea is that you look at him as pathetic Mm. because so great a being falls and then sees himself as a victim of a wrathful God. Mm. And so what it's actually describing to you is the, 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 the pity and the pathetic nature of him seeing himself as a victim of his own devices is one of the effects that being fallen and evil has on you. I'm going to regret saying this. Yeah. But 
the inability to see the I don't I, I don't want to say pathetic because it's just mm-hmm. gonna say what I'm about to say worse um, to see how Satan is not a victim mm-hmm. in that case right um, depending on how you read that right to see him not as a victim or to see him as a victim I would be willing to bet that if you stuck a hundred people, you could probably gauge, and they all read the story, you could probably gauge where their political affiliations <laughs> are based on that. Well, I would... I would s- Not saying that everyone who claims a victim is <laughs> Satan. Yeah. <laughs> kind of liberal of you. Okay, let's... That's <laughs> not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm can, saying. Well, no, no, no. Can mm. I, can I t- alter what you're saying? Hopefully. Please um, save me. <laughs> that you would actually see the the reflection of if you see Satan as a victim or you see him as pitiful because he sees himself as a victim is where you are with your own sin. So, Oh man, you're just making it worse. No, no, no. What I mean is, is that (laughs) if, if, if you voted for Trudeau, no, Oh yeah. (laughs) We're Canadian. No, what I mean is with your own (laughs) spirituality, if you see yourself as a victim be due to the sins that you commit, right? It means that your understanding of your sins as being your uh, rebellion against God. Oh, and not the outcropping of you being victimized and yeah. therefore justifies your sins. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Right? So if, if you, it still if you maybe have, makes it worse. If you, if you see yourself as the victim of something that's been done to you, rather than you're taking responsibility for the sins that you've committed, that, that tells you something about where you sit with your own sin. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what Paradise Lost does well, is it's if you sympathize with the devil, so to speak, you've got some work to do. Yeah. And everybody at some point in that book, 99% of people will probably have a bit of sympathy for him, a little bit, because we see ourselves in him, mm-hmm. a fellow rebel, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. to speak. But the, but the point of the Paradise Lost is not to, to describe what actually happened. Yeah. It's to describe the the depravity that we and him share or I just, it i just yeah. think that uh left behind books is such a sad um piece of literature is how much it's impacted evangelical theology yeah and it's and uh, it's and rough. i feel like it's a similar morbid curiosity to um to demonology, of course, not with the same vein of like, what is evil? That's so confusing. It's what is the future? That's yeah. what drives the sale of those things. I, I think what it also is, is it's the rejection of like people that are totally wrapped up in that sort of thinking. It's the rejection of scholars, actual mm-hmm. um, theology on those topics. Yeah. And it's, so it's, it's a rejection of like, you know, it's, get out of here with it's anti-intellectualism yeah. but it's also like they're just not content yeah like no well, it's the difference be more. between uh you know psychologists writing about love and taylor swift writing about love <laughs> you know it's how, like oh how many of the of the series have you read i think about seven or eight okay i read for like five okay yeah i think i read about three the, weirdly the best ones on the antichrist it's called nikolai yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like more of a political thriller. Here's the thing, though. It was it was a fun read for how ridiculous it is. Yeah. Like, when they're like, it's not coordinates, it's Bible verses. And dude, in your eight-year-old brain's like, whoa! <laughs> no, I read them when I was 18. Whoa, what are coordinates? <laughs> no, like, I, I walked into it. I was like, I know these are not real. It's probably 13 or 14. Maybe. Yeah. I was camping and read through, like, three of them. And it was just like, this is fun. This is Crazy. not right. For me, it was either that or Goosebumps. You remember Goosebumps? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Goosebumps actually made me less scared than the Left Behind series. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. And I don't know. That That's something that, that came to my mind. And uh, I feel like as, um, we'll say Christians in media. Are I, there other examples of like Left Behind stuff within Christian Christian art that you see that you go, I don't like that because it's, profiting off the Bible instead of using biblical ideals yeah. as good and faithful representations. You know, you know, Josh, when you and I go to a Christian bookstore, mm-hmm. you know those areas that we don't walk in? Yeah. They're there. 
<laughs> no, not necessarily. So there's. <laughs> I'm looking for examples, not areas that well, I can find. I, I'm saying I don't know the examples. I'm not hating I don't on like look at them. Max Licato or whatever. Well, yeah. I think a good 365 day devotional, everyone should do at least one. What about Dr. What is it? David Jeremiah? I have one of his. Yeah. <laughs> I think I opened it like four times. It's a little, um, it's not simple, but it's uh, a problem I had with those day-by-day devotionals growing up, actually, was that I would kind of just keep reading them. They they only kind of work if you only want to do three minutes worth of reading a day. Uh, they don't work really any other way. Well, so what's your view on Narnia? Um, oh, yes. This is actually the, the comparison I was bringing up with my wife. Um, it's a, it's an analogy. Yeah. Right? Or like it, it's a, it, it uses, it, it was a better example of something that is inspired by the Bible mm-hmm. rather than borrowing the um, authority of the Bible. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? And what then what about uh, Prince of Egypt? Prince of Egypt is, is awesome because it, it takes a narrative and makes a narrative mm-hmm. instead of taking prophecy or apocalyptic I wonder if it might just have a genre problem too. I think it does have a genre problem. Where it's just if you're trying to if you're trying to explain what happens in like the angelic realm. Yeah. yeah. Well and and here's what I was thinking about as well. <laughs> um is is Dunkirk a good movie if none of the wars happened? <laughs> Right, that's what. Is that one of the official questions? <laughs> no, no. I'm just thinking. I'm th- I'm thinking in real time, guys. No, it's a good. Well, no, no, no. But the the the, the problem there with that analogy is that <laughs> we're gonna lose people right here because this is a little more abstract. But yeah. So so the, your your premise is, is that if Dunkirk didn't happen and we just made a movie called Dunkirk yeah. about a fictional war, yes, that hasn't happened. Mm-hmm. Like if they made it in 19, uh, oh eight. Fictional war movies are still good movies. Yeah. Only because militaries do exist. So they're borrowing the authority from a structure like that actually being a thing. And that's what makes it cool. So you don't mean. So when you do a futurist approach to the book of Revelation and you borrow the authority of Revelation being positioned in the future, you take a theological idea and that's what puts the authority behind the existence of your story. That's irritating to me. Okay. So is there a fiction that could be made that is about revelation that you would be fine with guys we're storyboarding tonight i would love to do a storyboard of revelation because the casting would be awesome okay so um, no no but just wait just wait so so the premise you're saying is you could make your argument is you could make a movie or a book series on revelation no. you just can't claim that this is the fulfillment of the prophecy in the future yes okay maybe <laughs> Maybe. I think it would be difficult. Oh, yeah. I think it's difficult for the same reason that making uh, Exodus and explaining away all the miracles as natural phenomenon is an issue. Oh, do you mean the hit movie? Exodus, Gods and Kings? Yep. <laughs> yeah, Here's awesome. the thing. Still fun. <laughs> still fun movie. Still Christian Bale, who yeah. played Gore the God Butcher. And <laughs> Anyways, whatever. I like that that was the role you went with. Well, it's the most theological. Batman. <laughs> yeah. So... Do you remember uh, when we started the podcast? <laughs> Kill its thoughts in real time. You have to and okay we ended up having to delete the episode because Stuart was explaining for a good 45 minutes why Christopher Nolan's uh, Batman trilogy is the epitome of modern myth. Yeah, <laughs> it is. <laughs> so like, yeah. I agree. So with is them. the Matrix 1. Just the Just first the one. First okay, one. guys, we're getting off topic. I'm so sorry. Uh, thoughts in real time. Are getting well, the Matrix is also an analogy based on the Bible. It is. Yeah. Uh, okay, we can't talk about that. So is and that Christian art? Synthesis. See, <laughs> <laughs> all Western art is somewhat Christian art. True. To a certain degree. Bring this Joel, up with me later because I have. Hmm? You lose. Okay. Do you want to hear my actual thought on Matrix? Because we'll have to cut it out. No. <laughs> okay. It's better this way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Continue. I just came across one of my questions, and I, I don't think it's a good uh, segue. So, one second. It's okay. Just this might be brutal way to uh... segue. And now, you know, what's... should pastors be paid? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Next question. Next, next question. <laughs> that was actually one of the only questions. in cans of ravioli, though. Oh, here's actually a Gross. better question. Okay, adherents, followers, and those who have the Pentateuch as part of your tradition. 
Oh, this you is, mean the first five books? In the book of Exodus, when Moses is starting to deliver the plagues to Egypt. That's a weird way to say it. The he, text delivers says, <laughs> he delivers it. He delivers plagues. It is Toyota cell. <laughs> <laughs> the text says that one of the first was turning the water of the Nile into blood. But beyond its significance of the Nile and of itself... What? Beyond the significance of the Nile... Um, to mm-hmm. ancient Egyptian culture. Is there a basis in the thought that it was a reference to the previous Pharaoh's edict to throw Hebrew babies into the Nile? So basically he's, he's, uh, I've seen that before. Really? You've seen really, the Nile turn to question? blood? What? You've seen this question? No, no, no. I've seen people make that relationship. Yeah. Well, one of them is Exodus gods and Kings, the movie with Christian Bale that we just <laughs> talked about. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe, but I don't think, cause it's not just the Nile. It's water basins outside of the Nile as well. Mm -hmm. But that's also because the water flows from the Nile underground to the water basins. Well, no, but yes, but it's also containers of water. Yeah. But do you see that as a retribution for the sin of uh, Pharaoh's attempted genocide towards the Hebrew slaves? I would think the last one, you know, where he actually, where the genocide Mm -hmm. actually happens. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No, no, no. Definitely. But... (laughs) The, hey, don't laugh at that. We suck. <laughs> yeah. Well, because here's the thing. So the connection you could make is the significance she mentions earlier of the Nile being the provider of life, right? Is mm-hmm. now it's the provider of death. Okay. Right. Because it's made of blood, all the animals die. You can't drink it, right? So, and blood is a symbol of death. Um. So, but you also have Pharaoh made the Nile a symbol of death by killing babies. Mm. And so it's there, there, there's a relationship there with like that, the idea of like you have blood on your hands, like you, you caused this, you were the one that made, mm-hmm. you were the one that filled the Nile with blood. Um, and so sure. Maybe. Yeah. But I like it. Sounds cool. Monkey yeah. sees pattern. Yeah. Okay. Well, then and then it's also the my favorite thing with like the whole plagues is like they cause each other. Like, have you seen mm-hmm. that cause and effect chain? Because it's like, well, the water was turned to blood, so all the frogs had to leave the Nile, and so that's why they appeared on the land. So you're saying there's a naturalistic explanation for all the miracles? They try to make one. They try to say that the reason the blood's in the water is because there was a v- eruption in a vault near volcano up the river which is eventually the smoke coming from that is what caused the darkness which is also what killed the fish which caused the chain and then the dark, the smoke came that's pretty cool yeah pretty it's, cool. it's it's a it's a it's an attempt yeah anyway and then the river splitting was obviously a meteorite right um that's awesome i have seen that actually that sucks <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> We're still talking about Exodus Gods and Kings, by the way. Yeah. A little bit, yeah. Except I think in that one, it's uh, the sea is split by a, a Beyblade, I believe. <laughs> what? <laughs> you ever seen that video? Where like in the old Beyblade cartoon, there's uh, Moses is, <laughs> rips his Beyblade and <laughs> parts of the Red Sea. For real? Sea. Yeah, that's canonically in the Beyblade universe. <laughs> that Moses used a, a Beyblade. That's oh. awesome. It's You know what? If I saw that ad oh. when I was a kid... That would be good Christian. Oh, you know? no, no, no. And the 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 fire tornado, the, the pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke yeah. comes from the Beyblade. Not Hold that, on. Can, not that on deep the drive. Ground. Did they sell that? Did they sell the <laughs> Yahweh column Beyblade. of fire Beyblade? <laughs> <laughs> Biblically accurate Beyblade. <laughs> man. Oh, that's oh, going in the man. intro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Oh. Um I, I like that. That's a good meme. I'll post that to the Twitter later. <laughs> no, that's that's what we got to do now. We have a Twitter now with uh, four whole yeah. followers. So start they, posting clips. Yeah, the fans want clips. You know. Yeah. Um, this one is from. I would say it's a top fan because he has been uh, very responsive to our our topics, and uh, you he, know who you are. Is he somebody I know in real life? Yeah. 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 Um, and I'm going to, (laughs) 
And now he definitely knows who he is. <laughs> I'm going to summarize a, a question here um, that we got just recently about our uh, Raiders of the Lord's Ark episode. Yes. Okay, so we had mentioned during that episode um, that the Philistines, um, despite not knowing the edicts and uh, different things that edicts, that's not the right one, uh, etiquette uh, in regards to dealing with the Ark, they were not necessarily punished for their mishandling of it. Mm -hmm. But then once it returned to um, Israel, they just immediately died upon touching it uh, yeah. incorrectly. Now, does this have any relation to um, kind of the story of salvation or, or the word of God being written on the heart of every man that Paul talks about in Romans? You can make that argument early on in Romans. You can make the argument that you'll be judged based on what you know. Mm -hmm. The problem is the rest of Romans doesn't really support that. Yeah. Um, and there's enough. Uh, specifically, the situation that uh, our, our fan points out was, is it related to Paul and the unknown God statue in uh, in Acts? It's kind of like, because they still treated it with reverence, it's like, you're already worshiping a God, you just don't fully understand the there's many problems with that. actually I have a I totally forgot I'm sorry fan I have a written <laughs> response for you uh, it's like, oh I thought you'd already sent it no I oh, completely shoot. forgot okay. um, you'll be getting this it's long it's like 800 words 900 words <laughs> oh my um, goodness yeah anyway after this you're gonna get it and then um, you'll listen to this so there's <laughs> a little bit of it the, the the ark and the Philistines the reason the Philistines were able to carry it mm -hmm. Two reasons I think I can give. One, it allowed God to do his whole circuit of destruction of the Philistines and then bring it back home. The other thing is related back to the Satan thing we discussed at the beginning of the episode. Mm -hmm. With greater responsibility and authority comes greater punishment. Mm -hmm. And so because the Philistines had the Philistine people, right? The as we discussed in the story, the religious leader referred to God as the Lord in the covenant name and knew the, 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 um, the sacrifice, the sacrifices required. Yeah. Right. And he did it a, appropriately, but the people below didn't, they didn't even mm. know that Israel only had one God. They say their gods are coming into battle. Mm -hmm. And so the, they, they are completely unaware of See, what this thing is. I do have a comment. Is it possible that they do know the etiquette of how to carry the ark? They just know that they're not priests. They're mm -hmm. just they're just not Jewish priests, so mm -hmm. they don't. Yeah, because we assume that they're ignorant to how ark etiquette works, mm -hmm. right? Because well, they obviously they put it in front of Dagon and all that kind of stuff, and then it's like, oh, maybe, oh man, this is not mm -hmm. going well. But the reason why they put it on a cart maybe is because they're like, oh, we're not his priests; we can't carry it. Yeah, mm -hmm. so. It, we normally assume that they're ignorant, but it might be they're not ignorant, but they know they can't fulfill it. Yeah. At least the head priest yeah. that was uh, there. Maybe. It could be either knows. one. Yeah. Either one would, would explain yeah. it. Well, because he specifically states we have to grab these cows that have never been yoked. How, how that works into articulating mm -hmm. salvation. That gets trickier. Yeah, it gets trickier. And um, for our one listener, I have a whole written thing that I'll email you. Mm -hmm. And if someone wants to hear us break that whole thing down, yeah. uh, put a comment in and it'll be in the next Thoughts in Real Time. That'd be a really fun blog post is just to post the question alongside of the yeah. um, the answer. Yeah. I mean, if you already have 800 words for it is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> just, to, just to summarize the points I made is uh, they didn't know. So <laughs> the, 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 the responsibility to judgment ratio <laughs> is not there. And it allows God to fulfill what he wanted to do in the lesson he was giving to Israel hmm. um, in the story. So those are the two reasons I would go with why they were not punished for doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, in the same way that God had patience over Canaan for 400 years before judging them with Abraham and his family going to Egypt and then coming back 400 years later and God saying their time hasn't come yet. Mm -hmm. They said they don't know. I'm giving them time. Same with the Philistines. They and just Nineveh. don't know. Yeah. And Nineveh. Yeah. The yeah. repentance is bad. They don't, yeah. they basically probably don't even know what they're repenting, who they're repenting to. Yeah. But it's. Well, and Nineveh had a history of just 
whenever a god did something like that, which they got a lot because they were an enemy to a lot of gods, um, they had a they had a series of just repentances mm -hmm. to foreign gods to cover their bases. Mm -hmm. hmm. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's fair. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess we can't really get into the the soteriology of what that means. Right? Yeah, I think in the I Old think Testament, it I think worse. it's it is a not a good example of God's treatment of New Testament. Uh, no, I think context. I think it'd be worth maybe even doing a full episode on that. But mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Um, are we are we close to wrapping up then? Oh, we could go for about another fifteen if you wanted. Sure. Yeah. Um, I just had a question and I lost it just a minute ago. Like I had thought of something and then I, I completely. Is that because you put head. your phone away? It is because I put my phone away. <laughs> well, just looking for a question, Josh. Yes. Um. Uh, I had communion at an Anglican church. It's called Eucharist there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Not everyone can say big words <laughs> like me, <laughs> the Eucharist. Um, no, I'm just messing with you. Um, I understand. And it was wine because yep. Anglicans. And it was interesting because the t it's so bitter, right? <laughs> and you just sit there with that taste. It doesn't really go away. The wafer's the same, though. It's the wafer's the same, you know, cardboard. Bleh. It's funny that they say, like, you need the wine. Yeah, and then right. they use cardboard. And then they use, they use a Ritz cracker. <laughs> not even, not even. That An unleavened is, Ritz cracker. That, that, that thing is like pastely white, like paper oh. white and mm -hmm. thin and weird. Awful. Right? Yeah. Mm. Anyway. Doesn't taste like the bread of life to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not yet. It's not until you eat it. <laughs> Anyways, uh, that's terrible. Um Sorry. I we probably to, shouldn't be making fun of I the sacraments. I wanted sacrament. to uh, no, discuss no, something man. with Josh, actually. I don't know oh. if you've... Yeah, this one's just for you, buddy. Um, I'll fall asleep. Very recently, there was a big moment for Christian apologetics. And it's Ooh. been a while since my attention has been caught by Christian <laughs> apologetics. Is this what I think it is? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Continue. Um, Stephen C. Meyer yes. was on Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. Just recently. And we don't cover like super up to date stuff. And honestly, I, I, I used to listen to quite a bit of Joe Rogan, but not, not too much anymore. Yep. Um, kind of fallen into favor with just listening to comedians yeah. talk about stage time when I should be thinking about preaching. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Um, but what did you think of his defense of microevolution versus macro? So Stephen C. Meyer specifically, um, specializes in that conversation. Yes. Uh, being the like one of the four major leads of intelligent design. Mm -hmm. It says here on Wikipedia that it's uh, he's a pseudoscientist. So yes, you're right. Give Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing: the thing he presented is true. Um, there was a conference. They've done this multiple times with the major uh, leads on evolution, mm -hmm. non Christians, right? Just evolutionists talking about evolution, and they do not have a mechanism that specifically predicts and explains macroevolution. Specifically what that means is they don't know how something goes from one kind of creature to another, mm -hmm. a different species. Yeah. Um, and the reason given is because DNA is not just molecules. They're not actually, the function of DNA is not molecules. The function of DNA is that it's an actual information code. Mm -hmm. like computer code that that is translated mm -hmm. via RNA. So it's not just chemicals. And then when it sees the chemicals, boom, something happens. It's actual code written on that, that substitutes for info. Yeah. And there has never been a code mm -hmm. info in existence that just occurs. Yeah. All information that is, a symbolic substitute for an idea mm -hmm. has been created yeah, or presented by a mind. Yeah. And so the idea that laymen have evolutionary laymen, do we want to say just, just to break it down, mm -hmm. um, all things only come into being like buildings are only built off of blueprints. Yes. Blueprints are only drawn by intelligent yeah. minds. Mm hmm. DNA is a blueprint. It's yeah. raw information that is that 
tells um, biological forms to, yeah. to to organize in a certain pattern. Tells cells how to create proteins. Yeah. 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 Um, where, where the blue print come from. Yeah. Okay. And the idea is that when you go from, so you can have a creature change the size of its beak. That was the exact, the original example by mm -hmm. Charles Darwin was I'm observing evolution because there's this thing called the finch on Galapagos Island that when the conditions of the environment changes, the fruit gets harder and the finches with larger beaks can break through, but the finches with smaller fragile beaks can't. And so this, the small ones die out and the finches now have bigger beaks and that genetic code is passed down. But then when the berries get soft and larger, they can't get the beak in their mouth. So they need the small ones to be able to pierce through the shell mm. to eat it. And so then those finches with the large beaks die off. And so there's a, there's a trade off and there's a micro evolution of yeah. the species that changes over time. And the idea was with evolution is that that over millions of years, a small change every few generations would eventually create something completely different. But mm -hmm. for that to happen, there's a categorically different thing that's occurring, which is that new information is being added in the micro evolution. There's no new information that's being added. Yeah. Only mutation. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But, but, but there's no new code inserted. It's code that's already there. Yeah. And it's just turning on and off things that you have in your cells. Mm -hmm. And so for macro evolution, for you to become a, from a horse to a pig, there's new code that has to be inserted. Mm -hmm. And that just can't, it's never been seen. And the, the leaders of evolution, evolutionary theory, do not have an answer. And they vocalized that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's the thing he presented was with these two ideas. We've never observed new code appear and uh, the information is symbolic. It's not chemical. Mm. And so those two things you, we can't avoid. We have to deal with that. Yeah. Um, and what you saw was this guy got to present deep theological arguments for the existence of God on the largest podcast mm -hmm. on planet earth, more people watch Joe Rogan's podcast than all four major news networks in the United States combined. Yeah. And I think that's a God moment. I, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Like, and his, his testimony intertwined to that mm -hmm. is really good. Oh, it's so um, good. And I, I found it actually kind of jumpstart my, uh, Jumpstarted my uh, interest in apologetics again. Mm -hmm. It's been quite a while. Um, well, and the thing that it, that, yeah. so the thing that's been running in my head, if you follow Joe Rogan's episodes as mm -hmm. much as I have, is a f 20 episodes ago, a friend of his, of his converted to Christianity. And he brought up, he said, the, I, I, I now believe that God exists and Jesus Christ is my Lord because of a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't. He said, if I believe in all the theories that I do, I have to believe in this one because this one is stronger than anything else I believe. Mm. So how can I reject it if I believe all these other things? Right. Um, and so that was very interesting. And then you start seeing more people on Joe Rogan's podcast start coming around this. And Joe Rogan said he would read the book. Mm. Right. Yeah. And Joe Rogan only invites people onto the podcast that he is interested in and wants to talk to. See, I, I would love an interview between him and Bishop Robert Barron. Oh, yeah. Because I know how anti-Catholic mm -hmm. uh, Rogan is. Oh, yeah. Um, and yet, uh, Robert Barron has just this way with presenting. Mm -hmm. It's it's so good. He's I, the greatest. He is probably the top five greatest Christian communicators. Yeah. Um. But what I loved about the Stephen Meyer episode was that J Joe Rogan's been for throughout his history and life on the podcast has been obsessed with the origin of life mm -hmm. and how the universe came into being. Um, and, and what is the human experience? What's actually going on? And UFC fighting. And UFC fighting. Um, <laughs> and so those are the I like that it's like, hey, how does everything yeah. all come together? And also, can you kick a real hard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What does a bear sound like? <laughs> but here's the thing is Joe Rogan being who he is 
asked such beautiful, simple questions. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, you, it was so good seeing Joe Rogan even acknowledging the ideas, Mm -hmm. not, not just inviting the guy on to, to trash him or something Mm because he doesn't do that in the episode. He actually listens. Mm -hmm. He doesn't interject or interrupt. Yeah. He actually discusses and, um, dialogues and deeply contemplates deep yeah. ideas. I, I thought it was a, an excellent, I've watched, I've listened to it twice cause I, mm-hmm. I listened to it and then I was on a, a car ride with my wife and the, a bit of a road trip and we just listened to it like almost the whole thing. again. Yeah. And, it was, and I, it was I just see this growth in under, in desire for that Joe Rubin is having to talk about these things which is leading him to talk about Christ more and more. The fact that podcasts are even as popular as they are right now kind of shows that they, they are in some ways an outpouring of what the culture is feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, And you're seeing a rise of Christian podcasts show up. Um, I feel like there's more Christian podcasts now than there were when we started. Mm -hmm. And we've been here for a year, right? Like it's, it's crazy. Um, but that's that's also why I like these episodes is because it allows us to um, again be in real time. Yeah. Because ultimately, if we're going to talk about um, denominations being closer, if we're going to be talking about what our culture thinks of Satan and in in relation to ourselves, <laughs> well, what does God right? think of Satan? What does God think of Satan? Um, yeah. And and what do our modern, um, we'll say, political commentators think about uh, the gospel? I, I think this is a great environment for just. You know, three guys, sometimes four guys, um, just shooting the breeze and uh, really, really uh, hammering out some of these these big issues. Um, not that we'll solve anything tonight, but maybe by the time this is edited and sent out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's good. And anything else to, to add? Nah. I think just social media. Wow, that felt like a flat ending for a second there, didn't it? Anyways. Joel, what do we do on the internet? I just mess around until work is over. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, I scroll on YouTube. Really? Even um, YouTube? Shorts. Oh, dude, I think I've watched every Wendigoon episode now. <laughs> okay, we're not doing a review on <laughs> on your <laughs> YouTube habits. Sorry, you asked us what we Roll the outro. <laughs> I just keep watching guys making these huts. <laughs> Make a pool with no tools. So apparently wow. it's all fake. Yeah, no. They have I excavators. No. Yeah. <laughs> this shakes me to my very core. Okay, we got secondratesaints.com where you can find everything that we're doing um, now and in the future. Uh, we got our book reviews, we got our blog posts, and we got our episodes all up on there. Check us out on that. Um, if you'd like to contact us with uh, any more thoughts in real time, then just uh, you can use the chat feature on the website. You can use secondratesaints at gmail.com. And you can check us out on our Instagram and Twitter. Um, we Again, we love interaction. Um, but at the same time, we hope that uh, something in our conversation has uh, stirred something in your mind uh, or stirred a conversation in your uh, group of second-rate saints. Um, <laughs> please join us again next week for uh, another episode. I believe we'll be continuing in a Samuel series. Is that Probably. Right? I think a Samuel mm-hmm. episode's lined up. Yeah, yeah something like that. Um Thanks for listening. You can just, uh, I guess we just end it. There's demons out there. <laughs>